What does it mean to be mindful of the breath? It means something very simple. Keep the breath in mind. Keep remembering the breath each time you breathe in, each time you breathe out. Sometimes we hear mindfulness defined in other ways, but this is the closest we can get to English, in English, to what's in the Pali Canon. Keep something in mind. That's what mindfulness is. This translation for sati probably came from that passage in the Bible where it says, be ever mindful of the needs of others. In other words, keep their needs in mind. That's what the passage means. So be ever mindful of the breath. As for watching the breath, or accepting the breath, or all the other things that we hear but that mindfulness is supposed to be capable of doing, those are actually different qualities in the mind. You want to bring them together. The word for being watchful or alert is sampachanya, alert to what you're doing, alert to the results of what you're doing. And oftentimes those two qualities keeping something in mind and being alert to what that thing is doing, or how you're relating to that thing. Those should always be brought together. In the discourse on establishing frames of reference. Here. Those two are combined with another quality, which is ardency. You really stick with what you're doing. You really put an effort into it. Now, this doesn't mean you have to sit here straining and sweating, but it means is that you're continuous. You don't let things drop. Psychologists have shown that moments of attention are just that. You can, pay mo you can be alert to something or attentive to it for a very short period of time. But you need other qualities to stitch those moments together. That's what mindfulness is all about. It's what stitches things together. From moment to moment to moment, you keep these things in mind, whatever your frame of reference is, the body, the breath. That's all mindfulness has to do. You look, look through the books, especially modern books on meditation, and there's so many definitions for mindfulness. Poor word, gets stretched all out of shape. And it's not just a matter for scholars to argue over, because if you don't see these different qualities, if you don't understand the different qualities, they all get glommed together. It makes it that much more difficult for real insight to arise as to what's going on, as to what you're doing with the meditation. I've heard mindfulness defined as sacred presence. I've heard it defined as affectionate intention or compassionate attention. Well, the affection or the compassion, those are separate qualities. Those are not mindfulness. They may mean patience, goodwill, but be clear about the fact that you're bringing other things in as well. Sometimes mindfulness is defined as total acceptance or radical acceptance. Well, the acceptance is the equanimity, the patience, learning to put aside your preferences and just watch what's actually there. That's what equanimity is. Patience is the ability to stick with things even when the results don't come as fast as you like them, to put up with unpleasant things even though you don't like them. Not simply to put up with them, but also but with a purpose. You realize that if you simply react quickly to things, you want fast results and you just throw things away when you don't get the fast results, you never get results. At least not the kind of results that are lasting, not the kind of results you really would like. What this means is as we're meditating, we're bringing all kinds of qualities together. And it's good to be clear about it so that you can notice if things are out of balance a little bit, what's missing. It's not just a case of just piling in more and more and more mindfulness. 
your mindfulness enough to stitch things together, then you watch. That's alertness to see what's needed. It's like cooking, knowing that it's not just a question of things being salty or not salty. If you don't like the taste, you just add more and more and more salt. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes you've got to add onion, sometimes you've got to add garlic, sometimes oregano, whatever is needed. But realize that you've got a whole spice shelf here. This is why it's good to read the Buddhist teachings. Some people make a, a virtue out of ignorance. They say, if you read, read all the text, it just clutters up your mind. And there are times when that is the problem, but other times the problem is that you, you have your own narrow ideas about what's possible, what can be done in the meditation, what should be done in the meditation, and it's good to read the text to open your eyes, to expand your imagination. For instance, the old issue of the relationship between mindfulness and concentration practice. The Buddha never made a clear division between the two. Mindfulness shades into concentration. Shade, concentration forms a basis for even better mindfulness. The fourth jhana is where mindfulness becomes pure. The four frames of reference are the themes of concentration. And as John Lee notes, mindfulness, this ability to keep something in mind, as it grows stronger becomes but in the, concentra in the jhana passages is called vitaka, or directed thought, where you really keep your thoughts focused on one thing consistently. And alertness provides the foundation for evaluation. You notice what's going on with the breath. Is the breath good? Is it comfortable? You can make it more comfortable if you like. A little bit longer, a little bit shorter, deeper, more shallow, faster, slower. You have the right to make any adjustments you want to in the breath. Because meditation is not just a passive process of being present with whatever's there and not changing it at all. Mindfulness is stitching things together, but it also keeps in mind the idea that you want to be able to settle down here. I mean, there is a purpose to mindfulness practice. It's meant to lead into concentration. And so you do what you can to make the, the breath the place where you can stay concentrated, where it's more comfortable. Where the mind feels more and more at home. So evaluation is an important part of the practice, getting a sense of what's just right for the body right now. You can play with the breath. After all, the breath isn't just this movement of air coming in and out, it's also the, the energy flow in the body. And it's good to get sensitive to that. The energy flow in your legs, the energy flow in your arms in your torso, in your neck, your shoulders, all around your face, your eyes, your ears. When you breathe in, where do the currents of energy flow? Think of the whole body not so much as a solid thing that air comes in and out, but it's an energy field. And when you think of the sensations you have of the body as an energy field, Notice which ones seem blocked, which areas seem starved for breath meditation. You can feed them, you know. Make a survey. Which part of the body doesn't seem to participate much in the energy flow? We'll go, let it participate for a couple of breaths and then see what other part needs to be nourished. It's like feeding a flock of chickens. You know? Throw a little scrap of bread to this one, throw a little scrap to that one, until every, all the chickens are well fed. This not only makes it 
more comfortable to be in the present, but it gives the mind something to do so it's not bored. You can get interested in the breath. There's a lot to discover in the present moment. Insight doesn't come simply by putting up with whatever is there. It means testing, experimenting. This is how we learn about the world to begin with. If we were not active creatures, we would have no knowledge of the world. Things would pass by, pass by, and we wouldn't know how they were connected because we wouldn't have any way of influencing them to see what changing the causes would do. And it's because we act in the world that we know about the world. And if you're going to find out about your mind, you have to be willing to play with things in the mind, play with things, sensations in the body. That's how you begin to understand cause and effect, how you begin to understand the principle of intention. What role does intention play in your experience? It goes a lot deeper and it's more fundamental than anything you might have imagined. Your whole experience of space and time is based on some intentions that are repeatedly being made. So there's a lot of interesting things going on here in the present moment. But you have to experiment in order to see them. That involves the desire to do it, persistence, keeping at it, being really intent, focused on what you're doing, and using your ingenuity, using all of your powers of intelligence. This doesn't mean book intelligence. It means your ability to notice what you're doing and to read the results of what you've done, and to figure out ways of doing things that get better and better results. So we bring a lot of different qualities to bear on the practice. It's not just mindfulness. You don't just pour salt into the soup, you add other ingredients as they're needed. Some of them will grow without your planning. That's when alertness shades into evaluation, and evaluation shades into ingenuity. As, as John Lee said, evaluation, this is the, the quality that leads to discernment. We're training the whole mind, so you need a whole range of activities of mental qualities. Mindfulness is where things start, but it can't do all the work. It needs other qualities to help it. And as you realize that, it helps expand your imagination about what you can do here. What tactics you might try. That's why it's best not to load the one word mindfulness with too many meanings, or to assign it too many functions. Because then you can't clearly discern them when, when you need to see the difference between what say, goodwill does and the difference between what equanimity does. when you need one and don't need the other. So even though mindfulness combined with, combined with alertness is said to be the most helpful quality in the mind, it too needs help. So it's good to gain a sense of what other helpful qualities are in there. So you can put them to use, learn about them through the practice, and that way gain a lot more insight into the mind. And a lot more help into understanding how the mind causes unnecessary suffering for itself and how you can choose to act so that you're not doing that anymore.